I do remember the first guy in theater that I had a crush on and it was it was it was beautiful it was it was kind of stereotypical but it was real i finally saw those feelings in color and realized that everything else had kind of been in black and white no offense to the girlfriend from high school she's lovely i'm gay hi i'm jim parsons today i'm going to be looking back on some moments that have shaped my career and my identity this is becoming jim parsons But I've only been a knight for two. You have to pay your dues. I worked in the stables and helped in the kitchen. When I started, he was making the coleslaw. It hasn't been the same since you got knighted. I really just stirred it. This is Garden State. I haven't seen that in so long. I don't sit around watching all my old work, believe it or not. I don't know if it's the very first movie role I ever had. It was certainly the most visible anything I had done, other than a couple of commercials that people would recognize me from. I couldn't believe that I was going to play, or I was gonna say a love interest, but really it's more of a boy toy interest to Gene Smart. I was like, oh, wow. I was nervous to go on set. It was my first big set in that way. I just remember it being so much fun. Zach had this amazing ability to handle everything I mean, he literally wrote it, directed, and was starring in it. But he had a certain kind of calm that I think comes from being so happy to be doing what he was doing. Everybody was there for because they really liked it and wanted to be there for it. And you can see that. You can see it and the way it looks, everybody's face, their commitment to it. It's so grounded. It's so, and but ridiculous at the same time. I'm eating cereal in a knight's outfit times the limit of E to the oopsalon as it <laughs> So this is the Big Bang Theory, and that's me as Sheldon. That's a very Sheldon moment, telling a joke that, what are you talking about? Which was about 50% of the work I did on that show and enjoyed it for that reason. I'm like, I really don't know what I'm talking about, which was very freeing. Sheldon frequently said inappropriate things to people because he didn't no, they were inappropriate. And also the truth, there was nothing to, should be at the cost of truth. Early on, it came up that while they were keeping him not in a relationship, he would eventually probably be in a straight relationship. He hooked up with Mayim Bialik's character, Amy Farrah Fowler. I'll never forget that. And I was leaving the set to go to my dressing room and Mayim was coming on to do a scene and she goes, uh, did you read the script? And I jokingly said, do we do it? And she was like, and she went on. And I was like, oh, we do. We're doing it. Okay. I think I used the F word with Maya. We were close. It's hard to put into easy terms a 12-year experience that was so life-changing at so many different levels. And... So a lot of the changes that happened in my life because of that show were very gradual, um, much like the success of the show was. I am very grateful that I was able to live as much as I did unknown by the general public before acting took off into something. This is The Normal Heart on Broadway, my first Broadway show. This was a chilling experience. You know, I remember George Wolfe saying, at its core, Normal Heart is a horror story. These people are running from a killer that is mysterious and can't be seen, and they don't know where it's coming from. I was 10, 11, 12 during this time that we're representing in this play, the very beginning of the AIDS crisis. And it was harrowing to revisit it because it confronted me with a big factor that was added to my personal fears about being a gay man. It forced you to go back so fully into that time that it exposed me to a much better, well-rounded, never mind through an adult brain, view of what was going on. I think that I, think that I will go to my grave with the power of that being revealed to me. <sighs> 
it was hard. It was hard. It was my first time to do a play where you could uh, hear people crying. I had heard people laugh, obviously. I'd heard, I'd been in intensely silent dra dramatic pieces in, in live theater before, but I'd never been in something where you could hear people sobbing. And that was wonderful in a, in a very spiritual human way, but it was, it was heavy. Yeah, there was a lot that happened during that during that summer. Next year, I did another play, and Patrick Healy of the New York Times, in an interview about this play, said, last year you were in The Normal Heart, and he said, was that extra meaningful to you as a gay man? And I said, yes. And that was how I came out, um, which I was very thankful for. It felt organic. It was still a, a newsworthy deal. It got picked up everywhere. But it was, I don't know, it, it was a kind of an answered prayer for me of the way I enjoyed handling. It was just like, it felt right. It felt like my right coming out. If I could go back, I'd be a better man of a Muppet. Uh, but but I'll take what I gave at the time. That's that's fine. Oh my God, this is so funny. This came up in the dressing room recently, and you may or may not be surprised to know I I don't have at the forefront of my mind that I did this all the time. It, it, it's not that I've forgotten it, but like somebody will say like "man" or "a muppet," and I'll be like, "Oh my God, that's right." I don't think I auditioned. I think James Bob and the director. I. Th think he just offered it to me. And I'm not positive that other people hadn't been offered and turned it down first. Fools! I think a lot of people probably feel this way and it's just the rare few of us that get to go through it of like, I've always felt a little bit like a Muppet. And so, of course they cast me as the man version of a Muppet. Oh, I was thrilled. Thrilled. I mean, I would have never dreamed there was such a role to be filled and here I get to do it. Oh, we got together, me and Todd, it'll be 20 years this year. Part of the reason I didn't feel that intense about marriage was that I hadn't grown up with it as a possibility for my gay relationship with another man. And for a long time, I felt that way until eventually I felt that we were worthy of having a celebration for ourselves, inviting those closest to us to celebrate this relationship. I did feel like it was at least a healthy thing for me to be a part of exercising that right now that I had it and was in a relationship that was marriage material, if you will, whatever that means, so that other people could, there'd be more and more stories that you could latch onto as a young person to maybe make marriage, maybe it would, could become a dream for you. Sweetest part of it was that once we were doing it, once we did it, it did feel important and impactful at a personal level. Um, I am very grateful that that we did it. The ring. Uh, I didn't feel unhappy, but then I was, and then I was happier. <laughs> oh, young Shelton. Look how young Ian is. Uh, eventually, Todd and I ended up with a production company at Warner Brothers. We talked about doing a show based on my nephew, who is a very, very smart young man. Um, and in that way, a little bit of the odd man out of the family. I mean, you know, the joke is always like, if he didn't look like all of us, it'd be like, where did he come from? And so we were going to do this young guy being raised in Texas or somewhere in the South. Uh, who is an anomaly in his family having to do with his intelligence. And the more we started talking about it, the more I said, well, I can't, I can't have us go forward with this without me writing to Chuck Lorre first, because if anything were to possibly happen with this, it's just got too much overlap to Sheldon. So I wrote him and I said, I don't like spinoffs. And he said, don't worry, it's not a spinoff. It's really an origin story, which is very fitting considering all the origin stories that our characters on our show were obsessed with. So that's towards the end of Boys in the Band. 
if we could just not hate ourselves so much. That's it, you know. If we could just, oh, if we could just learn not to hate ourselves quite so very much. You picked one of the more humanistic moments of that character. No, he doesn't have plenty of them, but he certainly, he certainly has plenty of very vicious things to say after a couple of gins. Donald, you are the only person I know of whom I am truly ashamed. Some people have different standards from yours and mine, you know? And if we don't acknowledge them, then, then we're just as backward and narrow-minded as we think they are. Matt Bomer, who was in that clip um, with me, was the one who at some point on the movie set said, I never want to make a movie that I haven't done a full Broadway run of in, in advance because it really, it was unlike any movie experience in that way. I never dreamed of any moment like this. Look, I mean, when I was first started acting, one of my greatest hurdles was finding a way to be honest on stage without revealing my sexuality, both as a way to protect myself and sometimes for fear that my gay would, would ruin the take I would have on a straight character. And I definitely think that that deep, deep fear of being not only found out, but then abandoned once you were found out, I think it definitely affected my trust in myself because if I left myself to all my own choices, then eventually the truth would come out. And at some level, I felt that the truth that came out would make me be left alone um, without love or support. That's what's important to me and important to anybody who ever watches anything that I do is that I am able to share my life experience and and so whether or not the character is gay my not being afraid of being gay or anyone knowing that is so additive for another layer of richness to anything that i can play all the beds are occupied today. i don't care where you have to go and find one i don't care if you have to drive to ikea and buy one i don't care if you have to go to jennifer convertibles give my husband a bed Okay, sir. Okay. We'll find your husband a bed. Thank you. Well, that was Oscar worthy. You worked for Shirley MacLaine. This is spoiler alert. I read this book because Michael Osiello, the author of The True Story, asked me to do a Q&A of it at Barnes & Noble with him. And I read it, and my husband, Todd, saw me reading it. I mean, I was just, I was a wreck reading it. He was like, do you think it would make a good movie? I was like, I don't know. So he goes, well, I'll read it. And he's like, I think it'd make a good movie. I was so deeply moved, at least I could tell intellectually why, because so many things mirrored my own relationship that Kit and Michael had had. Uh, timeline, city, even proximity of like New York to LA for career reasons. At its core, what I discovered as we were putting it together is that um, it's not just that you have to risk getting your heart broken in order to live a full, rich life. It's really that you will get it broken by having a rich, full life. And that only by breaking your heart in that way do you open to the possibilities that you can have and then the amount of love you're able to give and receive for others, for yourself. You, you wouldn't wish a tragedy of like this or a sadness like this on anyone, and yet I would wish a life-changing journey on everyone. And that's what, that's what he gets. It's not pretty all the way through, and it's not easy at all. But, um, but I guess the stuff that really shapes your life rarely is, you know. If you ask people the main three or four things that really shaped who they are, being happy with who they are, they're almost all tragedies. And that was what really made me want to do it, was like, that's in its own sad way, one way of looking at it, that is a life 
well lived. I feel I'm being called to make sure I am ready and aware for that next thing that allows me to use who I am in a way that that shows me further down this path that is my life, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you so much for watching. This was how I became Jim Parsons.